Now to mosquitoes. <laughs> um, so there's a lot of really cool research that goes on here at the Academy of Sciences, and uh, that was just an example. This whole exhibit here is called Science in Action. It's a great place for you to just sit, relax, and watch some of the videos uh, about some of the research going on here and also in the field. But today, uh, I would like to introduce myself first. I'm Sonia. I'm one of the presenters here at the Academy of Sciences, and you are joining us for a special program that goes on every Thursday for the moment um, at 1230. It's called Chat with an Academy Scientist, and today we're going to have a chance to chat with a very special scientist. Um, this is the curator of microbiology here. Her name is Shannon Bennett. Can we give her a nice round of applause and welcome her here today? All right, now, just off of the top of your heads, anyone want to give a guess as to what microbiology is? Study of very small things and ah. how they work. Ah, so the study of very small things and cells and how they work. And I think that's a pretty good jumping off point. So, yeah. Shannon, what do you think about that definition? Does that cover it? Yeah, that's, I mean, uh, it, it's, uh, it's really the essential definition. It, and other people, depending on their perspectives, may add some other things. but. But the appropriate word is very small things because uh, microbes and microbiota and the um, microbiological realm is micro, so it's very small. And so we usually need a microscope to see it. And it can be very frustrating for someone that's into natural history to look around them and not be able to see the organisms they study. But we do get to see the effects of them all around us. So we see them indirectly because, of course, they are key elements to all the life that we see all around us. Inside, outside, they, they degrade soil. They uh, help us digest our food and absorb nutrients. So I'm very interested in the microbes that live inside of creatures rather than the microbes that live in the soil or in the water or in the air. And so in, indeed, there are some microbes that make their way from, oh, sorry about that. I totally just did that wrong. There we go. OK. Back to this again. Let's see if this works. And go. <laughs> OK, hang on. I can figure this out. Forget the fancy technology. We'll just do it this way. That's the mosquito, one of the mosquitoes I study. With the microbe, I study a virus that's transmitted between mosquitoes and humans called dengue virus, which I, I, I brought a model here, and you can pass it around. This is not to scale. This is much larger than the actual virus, and this is a completely non-infectious version of it. And you can see uh, as it goes around that it has um, a, a symmetry to the outside of the virus capsule. And that symmetry is uh, formed by the proteins that line the virus. Uh, those proteins are, are partnered in pairs and triples, triplets. And those proteins are what binds to our host cells and helps the virus enter our cells or the mosquito cells, depending on where it is in its life cycle. Wow, so what would you say, um, how many times would that be enlarged compared to the actual virus? Well, the actual virus is less than uh, 60 nanometers. So uh, nanometers is like 10 to the ni minus 9. So this is a very, very, <laughs> very small virus. Very, very, very small. You can't even see it with a regular microscope. You have to use a special kind of, of microscope yes. called an electron microscope. Now, this is a pretty interesting field, um, and I understand that you have a very interesting story about how you became interested in this field of work. Can you tell us about how you became interested? I believe it started when you volunteered in Liberia. Right, yeah. I, so uh, I always was fascinated with the natural world, and I used to go camping with my family in the summer as a young girl and follow the camp naturalist around and write notes about plants and animals and footprints that we saw. Uh, but I really wasn't committed to be a biologist when I grew up because I really wasn't sure what that entailed. Uh, then I had an opportunity to go to Liberia, and I was thinking about doing human aid, um, theater, uh, teaching. So I worked at an elementary school while I was there, and then we put on skits uh, to, to teach health care, some health care, primary health care skits. And uh, while I was there, I got very sick. I was. Um, in Liberia, West Africa, and, and I was very close to the Guinea border in a very small village that had no electricity and no running water. And uh, that's me doing my laundry, which was an ordeal. <laughs> and these are my students in the math class that I taught there. 
and I uh, got malaria. Even though I was on prophylactic medication, anti-malarials, I got malaria because the malaria was all resistant at the, by the time I arrived to the prophylactics wow. that we were still doling out in North America. So I got malaria, and uh, while I was languishing from fever and chills on a 24-hour cycle, I uh, was consuming a lot of water, and I wasn't careful about cleaning my water, and I got amoebic dysentery. And amoebic dysentery uh, is, is almost as bad as malaria. It causes a, a, it, it erodes your lining of your intestine. It actually tunnels through the lining of your intestine and, and eats the um, underlying layers of epithelia. So mm. blood leaks into your stool. So I That's started to stuff. notice I had bloody stool and I was... <laughs> <laughs> so, so the best experience ever. Right, and then, and yeah. then they, they, there was not a lot of health care there, so they, the, the nearest hospital was really a, a leper colony uh, down, down about five miles to the nearest town. And so they took me there, and, and I had, um, you know, on the way, actually, we, we had a small motorcycle accident, and so I, I got septicemia in my leg <laughs> from that. So, so what, I mean, what really got me was that I had been, the mis uh, malaria is vectored by a mosquito. Mm -hmm. So I was attacked on all fronts. I had parasites entering my body from the bite of a mosquito, from a fecal contaminated water, and from the environment through a soil contaminated cut. And as I was being hospitalized in the leper colony, pondering the uh, circles of life that intersected <laughs> with me to my <laughs> deep sadness, uh, there was an attempted coup. Uh, and I heard gunshots. And um, I wondered what was going on. And I found out later that, uh, that a general had come to try to in invade uh, Liberia, wow. an exiled general, to get down to town. And, if I hadn't been in the leper colony, I would have been a target. So uh, I always say that parasites saved my life. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's a pretty great story to get you uh, interested in, in this sort of career. That's um, that's really quite. It was uh, that's not. A good question. I Why yeah. were you there? I wasn't working with Peace Corps, but I was working with a similar non-governmental aid organization. It was a s volunteer summer program through my college. And uh, there was another volunteer, the other lady there doing her laundry with me was actually working at another leper colony on, uh, she was an economics major, and she was working on uh, how to market their, their uh, handicrafts. So we, you know, we were there for the whole summer, and I almost made it through the whole summer. Uh, they, they shipped me out after the coup. They shipped us both out after that. Wow. It was through a college, yes. But it was actually, it was a teacher in the college that had an independent non-governmental organization on the side. And so it wasn't a formal college enrollment uh, class, no credits, and th they didn't endorse it. <laughs> right, well, the school of life, right? I mean, that right. really has uh, brought you to your career of starting to study microbial uh, diseases and microbes. Um, and what are some of the places that you've been to that it's taken you on your studies? So I've always had a hunger for travel, as the trip to Liberia showed. So we've been, um, you know, I'm very interested in, in where parasites come from, not only how they personally affect me, but the evolutionary story of microbes. And a lot of uh, rich diversity for animal and plant life and microbes is in Southeast Asia. And so we've been traveling to, we've been to, to Singapore, we've been to uh, Vietnam, and we've focused a lot on Thailand, actually. Uh, Thailand has a long history of a virus that uh, I didn't get in Africa, luckily, but, uh, and I've managed to avoid, but it uh, occurs throughout the tropics, and it's called dengue virus, and it's the virus that's going around to everybody. Um, I also brought this virus. This is a, a influenza virus. So, it doesn't occur, uh, it does occur in the tropics, but we also get it commonly in North America. And what's different about that virus is it's not transmitted by mosquitoes, it's transmitted directly from person to person. So it's got a slightly more simpl simplified life cycle and that has lots of implications. But I was really interested in, in mosquito-borne viruses, probably because of that first encounter I had with malaria. <laughs> I was really fascinated with the, these complex life cycles that um, involve mosquitoes and humans. And uh, I also look at viruses in other animals because I'm interested in how viruses can jump into new host species. Now, based on the fact that you are working with these microbes that 
can infect human hosts, are you ever worried for your own safety? Are there other safety issues you have to worry about when you're in these remote countries? Uh, we take a lot of precautions. Obviously, we always drink very clear, clean water as much as possible. Mm -hmm. But uh, we protect ourselves from mosquito bites because we know most of the mosquitoes could, could contain infectious diseases. So, I, But I don't wear DEET or anything because I don't want to um, kill, kill off the mosquitoes <laughs> that I want to study. So we usually uh, treat our clothes with permethrin and we always wear long sleeves and long pants so that the mosquitoes don't have a harder time contacting our skin. And it's kind of a passive way of avoiding them. The, the, uh, the, the long sleeves and long pants helps for all kinds of field hazards and good boots. There's snakes in these areas. There are um, very dangerous plants on, on all fronts. So if you wear a hat and you wear um, full clothing. And then this is a picture of some elephant tracks that we stumbled across when we were uh, traveling through t to some of our field sites. And, and elephants in the wild are uh, pre unpredictable. All wildlife is unpredictable. So we look for signs like this and, and fresh stool f feces, and we avoid uh, trails that are being actively used. Now, out in the jungles, those aren't the only places um, that you go, but uh, when you are looking for mosquitoes, exactly how do you collect them? I mean, you yourself, I'm sure you're a very good bait uh, yeah. for mosquitoes, but uh, are there other methods that you use, or do you just stand out there and come on over? We're, uh, <laughs> we, we try to avoid that. Again, okay. I don't want to be bit, but I have had grad students come out in the field with me that are very attractive to mosquitoes, <laughs> and we'll have them stand still, and we'll use a sweep net to sweep them. So we have some really cool examples of so, some tools. Yeah, I usually uh, sweep sweep the ankles. Some mosquitoes specialize on ankles. Other mosquitoes specialize on ears. So we can often just sweep a person like that and collect all <laughs> kinds of mosquitoes. And then we get a bunch of mosquitoes in our neck, net. Nice. And, then, and then I have different tools to, to extract the mosquitoes from the net. This is a fancy uh, flashlight aspirator, we call it. So is that creating some sort of suction there? So it sucks it up. I'll pass this around. I'll pass this around too. It, it sucks up the mosquito, and then we can take it out of the sample chamber and cool it down. We usually bring ice or carbon dioxide, dry ice, if we have it, and we'll cool the mosquitoes down, and we can identify them and then preserve them for our laboratory studies. So that's a one handy tool that, that I use. And these are all to, to collect uh, mosquitoes that we directly encounter. But a lot of the mosquitoes, they're not active in the day when we're out. They're active uh, at dawn or dusk. The dengue mosquito is crepuscular. That means dawn and dusk active feeder. And there's a lot of night mosquitoes. So if we want to collect those adult mosquitoes that we don't personally encounter, we have a lot of traps. So this is a, a light trap that I've deployed up in the tree. This is me setting it up. And then uh, this is a carbon dioxide trap. So mosquitoes are attracted to us because of certain signals, certain cues. One cue is our body heat. The other cue is that we respire uh, carbon dioxide. And then there are a whole bunch of smells that we exude, pheromones and other, other uh, smells and chemicals. So this trap is trying to mimic the carbon dioxide uh, coming out, it's run off a propane tank that we can buy in Thailand easily. And then uh, it also emits a, a heat signal. And so the mosquitoes come to that very nicely and there's a little bag inside. The light trap um, attracts mosquitoes that are, are attracted to light, basically. They probably use light as a, a orientation cue, maybe towards hosts. And uh, so we get a lot of mosquitoes that don't specialize on humans in that, but we get a lot of mosquitoes that specialize on humans in that. And I brought, I brought a couple of traps, like this is, this is the light trap, and it runs off a battery, which hooks up to the bottom there, and, and it has a little fan. So as the mosquitoes come close to the light source here, they then uh, get sucked by the fan into the basket, and then we can collect them with the little shock cord. So you can pass that around if you want. And then I won't have this passed around because it's kind of big and clunky, but this is a, this is a trap that's based on carbon dioxide, like the big one I showed you there. And the carbon dioxide tank, like a pony bottle that people use for free diving, we hook up to there. Or uh, actually, I get them at Sports Authority, where they have paintball 
compressed gas cartridges, oh, CO2. Nice. And then this Zumba trap will um, has a fan in here, and the, and it's emitting carbon dioxide through these little pores, and it comes in over to here, and then it gets sucked into a bag that's inside. But the other nice thing about this trap, which is a carbon dioxide bait, not heat, is that it kind of looks like a human. So mosquitoes are visual creatures also, and they see something like this, and they'll come toward it because it's tall and upright and dark. So I always tell people when you go out on a hike, you know, avoid wearing uh, dark clothing because it makes you actually much more visible to mosquitoes to be Ooh. wearing dark, dark clothing. Very and, uh, interesting. They also use the dark sides of trees uh, for roosting places. So, so that that's all to collect adults. And and this is an example of an adult, which I'll I'll let everybody see, but. A lot of times, this is called a rear route chamber because actually most times we're trying to collect uh, larvae as well. So I might go into nature and look for breeding sites. Mosquitoes breed in water and I'll, I'll dip for the larvae with this reach fancy extensible <laughs> Looks a little bit homemade, yeah. Measuring cup on the end. Are and those then two rulers, some tape and a, a measuring cup? And my mother's turkey baster. Oh, very nice. Which is a nice kitchen tool you can use to collect mosquito larvae. Right, so science is accessible to everyone. Definitely. Everyone can have the tools. In your own kitchen. <laughs> it's fairly easy. I imagine that um, catching mosquitoes is also a very accessible thing for most people as well. Definitely. Once oh. we get the larvae, we'll put them in those cups and let the adults emerge. So if you, if you put your ear to the top, you can hear her buzzing. And right now I've got a wet cotton ball on top with sugar water because most mosquitoes in nature, um, the males will drink nectar and the uh, um, females can too. So you can keep them alive on a 10% sucrose solution if you're so inclined. So they're not all blood suckers and all then, the time. No. <laughs> And then this is a trap that we use to, we put water in the bottom and we use it to attract females. They come and lay eggs in the bottom of the trap. So it attracts, we are able to collect both the eggs and larvae as well as the females that come in and they can't get out again. Wow, so you have a lot of methods and uh, you also go to a lot of different kinds of habitats. Certainly if we go out into the jungle, there are gonna be a lot of mosquitoes, um, but I think all of us probably have the experience that in cities there are mosquitoes as well. Um, do your methods differ at all when you're looking for mosquitoes in urban areas? Yeah, so the mosquitoes that are occur in, in cities and towns are completely different species than what we might find in the forest. And they're attracted to different kinds of traps. So the oval position trap that's going around uh, that looks like a black bucket, that we use a lot in cities because the, the um, adult mosquitoes don't uh, really hone in on a light trap in the, in the city. We also do a lot of, yeah. uh, with the net, which we call man landings, we'll hand catch, this is a net, and we do a lot of larval habitat surveys. So we'll go around and we'll sneak around people's back alleys and we'll <laughs> siphon off their, um, the, the water underneath their potted plants or, or in, in garbage dumps and, and things. So these are sh both shots in a small, urban area in, in Thailand in a town called Nakhon Nayok. Those are Buddhist monks. And this is my grad student, John Winchester, who works for the U.S. Navy. Uh, he was being supported to do his master's on mosquito distribution. Wow. So uh, Thailand is not the only place you've gone. What other cool places have you gone? Right. Well, so we go to Hawaii a lot. We're very interested in dengue virus in Hawaii. Uh, has anybody heard of dengue virus activity in the U.S.? In Florida, we've had a couple of years running a very intense dengue outbreaks, and, and it's because of two specific mosquitoes that occur there. The mosquito that's going around, that's a West Nile virus vector, which we have here. We don't get dengue here, but the vector for dengue just showed up in LA, and it's been coming, it's well established. So mm. we, could, we could potentially have, have the potential, at least for dengue transmission in LA, and we have it in Florida. So Hawaii also has dengue, and it's got the two mosquitoes, and, but they are very have distinct distributions, so we want to know where they occur. So we're sampling in Hawaii, and some of our sample sites include this one. I always laugh, because this is a nudist beach. So the, the, uh, the excitement of Thailand is quite different than the excitement of Hawaii. In Hawaii, there might be no raging elephants, but there are <laughs> nudists running around at some of the beaches like this one. Well, that is something. Um, now, I understand you work a lot with uh, the local people of the areas, um, grad students as well, other researchers, um, and then you, you bring some of that information back and you have to process it in the lab. 
Um, what do you accomplish out in the field? And then what do you have to do when you get back to the Academy of Sciences? Yeah. Like, what next step is there? It's very, it's very challenging to get the mosquitoes out from the field, a field setting like this, and keep them cold and then get them back to the lab because we want to study the genetic material, both of the mosquito and the microorganisms like the viruses that live inside them. So we often have, uh, in Thailand it was great because all the, the locals that are running food carts can buy dry ice to keep their, food, their ice cream carts cold. So it was actually very easy to get dry ice. It's very hard to get it in Hawaii. So we have different methods of preserving the mosquitoes in Hawaii. So this is a, Thai, a local Thai uh, undergraduate student that has since done her master's with me at the University of Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And now she's joined me here. So we're very excited. And, um, and this is... Uh, this is Uncle Kaleo. In Hawaii, uh, you greet elders as kapuna. So this is the kapuna of a, an area of recent lava flow. And he has a homestead on this, on this recent lava flow. And, he, and we're teaching him, we're showing him the traps we're going to put up. He agreed to let us sample his area because the mosquito populations are jumping across recent lava flow. And it seems to be spreading mm. uh, toward the Hilo side of Big Island. So he's been... Uh, it's really important to be able to talk to local people and explain what you're doing and have them uh, help you, and they are very helpful. Indeed. So when we get these mosquitoes, we can bring them back to the lab. If we've preserved them properly, whether they're larvae or adults, I study their genomes. In the labs downstairs, we have a, a full microbiology and molecular lab downstairs where we can extract and sequence DNA and discover where viruses come from. Wow. Does that, um, do you spend a lot of time looking into microscopes? Well, like I said, viruses aren't very visible in microscopes, uh -huh. so most of the time I don't, unfortunately. I usually look at computers. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the sequences of, the, of DNA. Now here's kind of a fun one. Um, I understand that you bring your daughter with you on a lot of these field expeditions. Um, does she have a good time? Are you a little worried that she might be uh, in danger from some of these infections? What do you do to protect her? Right. So my husband, who's shown back here in the tan colored shirt, this is my graduate student. Uh, he's an entomologist and an evolutionary biologist, and he's uh, coming at it from the mosquito side. And so we travel together a lot into the field. <coughs> so. We bring our daughter with us, because what else are we going to do? And this was when she was three years old on our second field trip to Thailand. And she's exhausted after a long day of field work. But she's a real trooper, and uh, she has very sweet blood. So we protect her as much as we can, <laughs> and sometimes use her to sweep net around. But um, <laughs> I always laugh, because on this field trip, uh, the driver of the van. In Thailand, you don't drive around yourself. You hire drivers. And we had, a, we had hired a driver. He was very late showing up to pick us up at one field site. And when he showed up, uh, he immediately kind of passed out on the front of the van. And then he, he uh, drove us a little bit. And then he jumped out and threw up in the ditch. And uh, he was coughing vigorously. And we were sitting in, we were about 12 people sitting in rows of the van. And within 18, within 12, hours really uh the first the people directly behind him which was me and my daughter Annika got sick oh no and then and then about six to twelve hours later the sickness popped oh. up in the people <laughs> as they moved towards the rear of the van and and something that infectious we think that he had norovirus which everybody's probably heard of the cruise ship virus so it's highly transmissible it's directly transmitted it has a respiratory element as well as a gastrointestinal uh, element so we we got pretty sick but but that was the only uh, illness that we ever contracted in our field work. So we mm. managed to avoid mosquito-borne diseases. Very nice. Yeah. Now this would be a really good time to take some questions from the audience. If anyone's been kind of curious about anything uh, about the field work or being a microbiology curator. or You should go back to that picture with the blood-fed mosquito because oh, I yeah. wanted to mention that. This is a, a very exciting... She got norovirus, too. She threw it really quickly. The rest of us were pretty incapacitated <laughs> for a little longer. But <laughs> yeah, we were posing for photos. That's a good question, actually. <laughs> Normally, we do wear long sleeves. And in that one, she was exposed. She was a real, uh, she's very uh, feisty. So it was always a struggle. Put it on. Take it off. Take it off. <laughs> very nice. So this is an example of a mosquito that was blood fed that we collected off of one of our volunteers, that being my husband. And, and she basically, she ate so much blood that she passed out. And then she revived a little later, and that's her in the tube. 
So when, when they pass out like that, they, they're really easy to catch. Now, uh, if no one else has a question, I'm actually, oh, yes. Um, so, like, you've got diabetes, like your blood sugar's a lot higher. Does that mean you're more likely to get more mosquitoes? Ah, so if you have a higher blood sugar, say you have diabetes, are you more likely to have uh, mosquitoes attracted to your blood? Yeah, so mosquitoes aren't attracted to, to sugars per se. They're attracted to a different kind of chemical. And different, different studies have, been, um, have gone on to try to pin down what things are the most the key elements. And because the mosquitoes are honing in on heat, so if you've recently been running or hiking and you're sweaty, uh, there's two things going on here. You're breathing heavily, you're hot, and you're also, you have a strong smell, a strong mm. human smell. And one of, the, one of the old tricks, if you're in the field, to really attract mosquitoes is to take a, a pair of dirty sports socks that <laughs> have been in the bottom of your bag or your suitcase and hang them up. So it's really human smell that they're honing in on mm. rather than sweet. It, but, but, um, That's definitely part of it. Also so our breath is primarily carbon dioxide, but there are other chemical elements, definitely like ketones, that make them uh, more attracted. But my my um, Thai graduate student, her nickname is Sweetwater Nom Chiam in Thai. So we always tease her that she has sweet blood, but it's not really uh, <laughs> sugar per se. It's other other elements. Indeed. Are there any questions from the uh, online audience? No. Ah, the question about the AIDS virus, do you know much about that, yeah. where, where it originated? Right, it came from Africa. We found, um, well, we're not really sure, actually. So there's a wild reservoir of an HIV-like virus. It's called SIV, simian immunovirus, and it shares a common ancestor with HIV. And so far, it's been distributed pretty widely in Africa when we find it in wild primates. Mm. And so we think some, you know, we're not really sure exactly. There's been lots of intensive sampling in East Africa, so possibly Kenya, but uh, no one really knows yet. It's hard to tell. Yeah. Now, you study um, not not only microbes that we think of as the diseases and the things that are kind of negative, but there are also those posi positive microbes that you talked about, those that line your gut, help us digest. Um, with this culture uh, that is more recently sort of popular to have antimicrobial soap or antibacterial hand sanitizer, um, what do you think about that trend there? And, and are we doing um, more damage than good? Yeah, I think, you know, it, we've really only begun to, uh, to fully describe the microbes around us. And just describing them isn't really enough to know what they do. Of course, we know the ones that cause disease uh, because those have been our focus. But there are plenty of microbes that we're finding out are really critical to uh, life and including our own health, human health. And uh, recently, the Human Microbiome Project has just been published. There's articles in Science and Nature, and it's uh, freely available online. Uh, and it describes an incredible amount of diversity of microbes that live on every part of our body, inside and outside. And they're all critical. Uh, to our, our good health. And so we don't really know when you uh, apply antibiotics to your skin what, what you are doing. And you may in fact be actually selecting for uh, the wrong kinds of bacteria, the bacteria mm. that transmit disease or might be unusual, rather than the ones that usually accompany the surface of your skin, for example. So do you Studies have, show that just yeah. washing your hands with soap and water is adequate. And just rubbing your hands with hot soap, if, with water, is, is is adequate. Do you have any, um, are there any implications from your research or do you have any advice for um, us as a community to make sure that we are safe from some of those bigger issues, those bigger diseases and those uh, harmful microbes? Well, I just, I always believe in education, so I always recommend that people educate themselves in terms of the microbes around them. If you're traveling, you should ov obviously know what kinds of disease organisms are being transmitted in the area. We have disease organisms here that are transmitted, uh, such as West Nile virus and California encephalitis virus. Those are viruses that are transmitted at by night-biting mosquitoes, so if you're out and active at night, uh, I recommend you protect against mosquito bites. Uh, obviously, in, protect yourself from work or public space type mm -hmm. born diseases like influenza by washing your hands. Indeed. 
Well, um, I want to really extend a thank you for coming out and spending some time with us and talking with us. Can we give her a nice round of applause? Sure. And uh, thank our on online audience, if we have one out there, or anyone who is going to be watching this video later for all your interest. This is really one of the very neat parts of the Academy of Sciences that people don't often get to see. This is the behind the scenes. Um, your office is down in the basement. You yeah. still get some sunlight, right? Yes. <laughs> um, but one of those things that's happening behind the scenes, learning about uh, the smallest life, some of the smallest life on Earth, yeah. um, not something that you get to see here on the museum floor. So I want to thank you all for coming and supporting us. We really couldn't do any of this without you. And if you'd like to come up and talk further and maybe take a look at some of these cool tools, come on over. But thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, everybody.